Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is the Reverend Natalie Thomas. I'm a minister at St. Barnabas Falmouth, which is an Episcopal church in Falmouth. And we are so glad that you are with us tonight. Uh, as Episcopalians, we follow a God that created the earth and cares and loves for every part of creation down to each blade of grass. And we are very grateful tonight to have Doug with us and to share your wisdom and to show us how we can more fully live into uh, what we believe to be God's call to care for creation. And if anyone is looking for a place to have conversations with us about how your care for environmental justice can fit with spirituality and faith, St. Barnabas is an open and affirming congregation, and we'd be really glad to have any of you uh, join us. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Jessica, who's going to facilitate the panel. Thank you. So I'm Jessica Mark Welch. I happen to be a scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory. Uh, but here I'm uh, here to give you first just the housekeeping details. So we're planning for a talk of about an hour and then a uh, half an hour for question and answers. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat where everyone will be able to see them, type them into the chat or put them in the Q&A, but I think it's easier if everyone just uses the chat. Uh, we cannot see or hear anyone, so you just have to put your questions there and I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Um, just so you know, this presentation is being recorded and it's also being streamed live on YouTube if we fill up past our uh, limit of people who can see on Zoom, then we can, we can, we'll also be streaming to YouTube. And I also encourage you to engage speaker view so that you aren't distracted by seeing our smiling faces. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Doug Tallamy. He's a professor at the University of Delaware in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. So he studies insects, teaches about insects, insect ecology, behavioral ecology, and humans and nature. And he's written a couple of just fantastic books telling us what we can do as individuals, as citizens, to help the ecology of the world. So. With no further ado, Doug Calamy, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I, I tell you what my idea of, of nature's best hope is tonight, I want to return to what happened last year. Not sure if it reached Cape Cod, but uh, over most of the East Coast, all the way to the Mississippi, we had what we call an oak mast. All the oaks in the red oak group got together and decided they'd make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it, and I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn, and it didn't take long, made a little hole, and then started to squeeze its way through. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy popping out there. Finally, it dropped down. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because uh, it is a, a, a good meal. Lots of things want to eat it, so it's got to get to safety, and it does that by wiggling and squirming and goes underneath the ground in about 30 seconds where it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber within which it turns into a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. Now, a lot of people think weevils have big noses because it certainly looks like they do, but this is actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here at the end. Uh, females chew with those mouth parts down into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg in the hole, and that's how the larva gets down there. Well, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Uh, and the answer is that red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, they wouldn't have enough acorns. That leaves, of course, a hole, a true vacuum in the, the acorn. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, in this case, uh, she has filled it with three species of ants in the genus Temnothorax. Uh, and when they find a brand new vacated hole from an acorn, they get very excited because this is where they want to move their colony into. Uh, their, their old acorn is falling apart. They've got to find a new one. So they get uh, everybody ready to go and they move the uh, entire colony, the larvae, um, the eggs, the queen. It takes them about 30 minutes, but in they go. Then they post a guard at the door, make sure nobody else comes in, and they'll live there for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, what is your point? What are you trying to tell us? What I'm trying to tell you is that's just one of literally millions of highly specialized interactions that comprise nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of, of uh, oak acorns. They can fly up to two miles from the parent tree. They tap the acorn below the, the ground 
And of course, they want to uh, use it during the winter time if they can remember where they put it. But their memory is not perfect, and they only remember where about a quarter of the acorns they bury are. So they end up uh, each jay plants about three thousand oak trees a year. You won't have pileated woodpeckers breeding near you if you don't have lots of carpenter ants because that's what they feed their young. Beak here is filled with carpenter ants. And you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You're not going to have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can reproduce on. As a matter of fact, pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. Out of the 4,000 species of native bees, uh, over a third of them are highly specialized. For example, there are about 13 species of, of bees in the Northeast that can only reproduce on the pollen of uh, perennial sunflowers. You're not going to have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. So nature really is a series of specialized relationships. But today, these relationships and nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the, the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the, the uh, process to create the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that today leaving the country as it was is no longer an option. We have uh, it's only about 5% of the country that's anything close to its original pristine condition. And that's because we've, we've logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We have 770 million acres of rangeland, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it and otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our, our natural areas. In short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? Well. For a long time, we had the idea that the, the earth, our nest, was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population. The UN now predicts we're going to lose a million species to extinction. And possibly in the next 20 years. And I love the way they present these, these headlines as if it's just another headline. They might as well say, we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then just go on to another headline. I mean, this is not an option. It is not an option to lose the other species on planet Earth. Well, I could go on uh, talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and, and, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, the most famous entomologist uh, probably ever, but certainly of our times, from Harvard told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects on planet Earth. And he did it in this paper way back in 1987, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants uh, disappeared, that would drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats. In other words, the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds and mammals, and even our freshwater fish, they would collapse and all of those creatures would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients. And all we would have left are, are fungi and, and uh, bacteria. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that we can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are, are products of, of nature. We're totally dependent on the services that ecosystems produce. Here's some of the things that uh, plants give us. They produce oxygen, pretty important. They clean water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too, too salty to use. Here's a really important one now. Plants, of course, are all day long are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, taking the carbon, using it in, in their own tissues for growth, but 
This is the big one. They're pumping extra carbon into the ground through their roots. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have deposited there over the eons. Plants also build topsoil, hold it in place. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So again, designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but it's a terrible option now because we got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services now than ever before. Now there were visionaries through the ages who recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with the land. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent in the first part of the, the 1900s. Uh, he wrote extensively. One of the things he said was the oldest thing, the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Uh, now many of our indigenous groups were good at doing that for long periods, but our, you know, our burgeoning Western and, and Asian societies are terrible at it. We, we uh, typically remove more from the earth than the earth has to offer and then move to another place and take more than she has to offer. And we do it over and over again. And Aldo, of course, was, was very concerned that that is not at all sustainable. So he had a dream that we would actually create what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to, to use the earth. Uh, we had to farm it and lumber it and graze and do all of those things. But uh, his dream is that we would learn to do it gently, that we could do it without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote, wrote about that in his very, very famous book, Sand County Almanac. What he never talked about was developing a land ethic where we lived. And, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans in nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have even recognized it as an option. What I'm gonna to argue tonight is that uh, living with nature not only is an option, I'm gonna argue that it is the only viable option left to us. You know, in the past conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We need to, we, we need to turn that on its head and we need to save natural systems, but you know, since mostly they're gone, we need to restore them where people are because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we need to find ways for nature and, and, and humans to thrive together in human dominated landscapes. Where are we gonna start? Well, let's, let's return to private property. Um, we can't plan conservation efforts without including private property because most of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. I think 95% of Texas is privately owned. We can't just write those places off. We have to do conservation on private property. But there are a lot of places that could be used for conservation centers that right now we don't think about. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? 21 million acres in that type of rights of way. Another 3 million acre in railroad rights of ways. 17 million acres in roadsides. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge places. And we have all the areas where we live, both in rural areas, our suburban uh, places, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres there. If you take just these, and you can think of other places, add them up, that's 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? Uh, well, it's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, plus New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even throw Texas in there. So not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We've got plenty of places we can do conservation. Now, when I use the word conservation, I'm, I'm, I'm actually misusing it. I'm not talking about going out and preserving uh, natural systems that are still intact. I'm talking about putting them back together again after we've already dismantled them. Uh, and that means we have to start with the, the most important species, the building blocks of ecosystems, because all species don't contribute equally to ecosystem function. So we got to put the species that other species depend on back first. And one of the first things we have to do is rebuild a food web. Remember, plants are capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into food. And that is the food that supports all the animals on the planet. But they have to have access to the the, that food. And most animals do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something typically is insects, but most of the insects that are eating plants 
and passing energy to other animals turn out to be caterpillars. They are the most important forms of energy transfer uh, that we have in the animal kingdom. So if we were to uh, build landscapes that don't include caterpillars, most of the energy would remain locked up in plants and, and that's where it would stay. We wouldn't have other animals. Let's look at the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, we have a lot of data on, on chickadees. They're at our feeders right now. Actually, uh, you've got uh, uh, black cap chickadees, uh, but they're doing the same thing. Eating seeds. 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seeds. The other 50% is insects. But when they're reproducing, uh, they, their babies can't eat seeds. So they have to switch entirely to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will feed their young entirely on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, there's actually lots of sources of data that suggest that, but we had a grad student recently, uh, Ashley Kennedy, who um, had a citizen science project. She put out a call to bird photographers all over the country saying, please send me pictures of birds as they were flying to, to the nest with food. The object was to identify what was in the beaks and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many birds as she could. And it turned out she got thousands of pictures and she was able to rebuild the nestling diet for uh, 20 common bird families in North America. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets that are caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system. 16 out of the 20 common bird families probably would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. Let's figure out what it is. There's lots of things special about caterpillars, and one of them is they're soft. Think of this guy as, as uh, if he were a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton. It's undigestible. Birds don't want a lot of exoskeleton, and it surrounds lots of good food. And because they're soft, the, the parent can stuff it down the throat of their baby without fear of injuring them. And if you ever watched a parent bird uh, feed its young, they're pretty rough. It's like a beak's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Uh, caterpillars are, are relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our, our birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or eat one caterpillar? They're nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to many other insects, particularly beetles, which are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. Uh, a lot of undigestible material in a beetle, and they have a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love uh, organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. They have to get them from plants and they have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, says I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene and my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I eat all of those things because they stimulate my immune system. And I cannot think of a, a better time to have a strong immune system. Antioxidants or, or carotenoids or antioxidants that, that run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about uh, male birds. Uh, so for example, this male prothonotary warbler is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. And he takes those lutines, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? Of course, from the prey items that they bring back to the nest. Uh, but the carotenoid content of what birds eat is not at all equal. So these first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have by far more carotenoids than any other type of, of bird prey. The third bar is uh, orthopteroids, things like crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Here are the adult caterpillars over here, the moths and the butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids. And the earthworm way out here, um, the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this influence the way birds uh, hunt for prey? Well, Ashley did another uh, study where she, looking at bluebirds, she put GoPro cameras on the roof of bluebird houses. And those cameras took a picture once every second. The idea was to get a picture of the bird as it flew into the box with a prey item. 
and she had a lot of GoPro cameras and a lot of Bluebird boxes and she did it for three years. So she ended up with over a million pictures that she had to go through. But out of the million pictures, she got 7,628 uh, pictures that were good enough that she could identify what the prey item was. Uh, and she found a very nice relationship between the prey items that had the largest amount of carotenoids, those caterpillars, and how often they were brought back to the nest. Uh, followed by those orthopteroids and then everybody else with not many carotenoids is way down here. So all this suggests that, that caterpillars uh, probably are not optional parts of, of bird diets. They're essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say birds need caterpillars. How many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, again, let's, let's return to chickadees. A lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? One or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And that's just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. After they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days, but they're flying all around and too hard to count them then. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and you do want chickadees breeding in your yard, because if they're not breeding in your yard or somebody else's yard, where are they gonna breed? That's all that's left in so many places. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. They only forage about 50 meters from the nest. And if you don't have all of those caterpillars in your yard, you're not gonna have chickadees. You're not gonna have birds. You're not gonna have the insects. That's called insect decline. And it's really looking like it's uh, highly, uh, a, a one of the important causes of, of bird declines. I say that because we took a look at the data that Rosenberg et al. used in their 2019 paper uh, documenting the loss of 3 billion birds in North America. And we split the birds up into two groups, the birds that need insects at some part of their life and the birds that do not need insects. They can, particularly during the breeding season, they can rear their young on seeds, things like finches and doves. They actually gained some numbers during the last 50 years, but the birds that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species in the last 50 years. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there is a strong link between the loss of insects and the loss of birds. So now remember, I'm using birds as an example. They're not the only thing that eat, eat insects and certainly not the only thing that eat caterpillars. If we want to have other creatures around, we have to start landscaping for caterpillars. It's a new way to landscape. We haven't thought about that in the past. So how do we do that? How do you add caterpillars to landscapes? Well, you do that. You add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make those caterpillars. There is a catch though, and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be very choosy. We have to add the ones that do support a lot of caterpillar species. Uh, why don't all plants make caterpillars? Well, caterpillars are really fussy about what they can eat. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. Uh, if you want monarchs in your yard, uh, having crepe myrtles or boxwood or, or um, any other plant other than milkweeds is not going to work because that is the only thing that monarchs will eat. They're, they're what we call host plant specialists. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are highly specialized that way. They can only eat uh, particular plants. Why? Because plants have made them host plant specialists. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And if you don't believe me, next, next year when there are green leaves out there, go outside and eat a leaf. I don't care what it is. You're not going to like it. And that's why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those leaves. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants that are out there. They're simply too well protected. There's a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. Yes, that's my little joke. This is not a joke though. We do know that insects eat, eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat one or two plant lineages that are sharing a common cocktail of chemical defenses. And they do that by uh, developing the adaptations that allow them to circumvent those defenses. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds. They develop the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations that, that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of, of uh, exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. 
all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild food webs where we've dismantled them in the past, we're going to have to choose, pick and choose plants very carefully. And I'm going to give you three examples of how, how this works, starting with uh, our own house here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in that window right, right there. Uh, we have 10 acres in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was a farm that was broken up. A very old farm had been farmed for uh, 300 years, so starting in the late 1600s. Uh, and the soil was exhausted. The last thing they did before they broke up the farm was to mow it for hay. But the land is heavily invaded with Asian uh, ornamentals. So things like multiflora rose and oriole and bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and all of those guys. So when they mowed for hay, they were really mowing mostly uh, Asian plants and this calling it hay. So when they stopped mowing, this is what came back. They were never killing the rootstocks and the 10 acres looked like Sleeping Beauty's castle. It was just covered with these vines and, and Asian invasive species. That is my wife, Cindy. She's getting ready to get rid of all this stuff, which she has done. She has done. If you've got a, a serious invasive species problem, don't despair. You can get a hold of it. it. It's a lot of work. There's no doubt about it. Fortunately, she enjoyed doing it. What was I doing uh, while she was working hard? I was, I was telling her she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back. Uh, and, and I did it selfishly. I, I would put plants back that I hoped would attract caterpillars that I wanted to take a picture of. That's my little hobby. Uh, and the Canadian owlet is an example. Uh, we didn't have any Canadian owlets because, and that's what the adult looks like, because we didn't have any meadow rue. That is the only plant that they develop on. Uh, meadow rue uh, used to grow here probably three or four hundred years ago, but long gone with all the agriculture and there's no meadow rue around. I can't, couldn't find any seeds. Uh, so I, I got some seeds from someplace else and planted them that grew just, just fine. But this is an experiment. I didn't know if I'd ever be able to attract the Canadian outlet to our, our little meadow rue planting here. So I didn't go out and check it. About a month and a half later, I just happened to be walking by my meadow rue, and here they were they were uh, almost completely defoliated by Canadian owlets. They had found them right away. And now we have a very uh, healthy um, population of both meadow rue and Canadian owlets. So we have added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's actually a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. Um, I did know where there's some some Bidens uh, in in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them. They grew very nicely. It took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my my Bidens, but uh, they did. Now we get a good population of, of both. So there we go. We've added four species to the property. Wanted hackberry emperor. It's a butterfly that ought to be here, used to be here. But as the name suggests, it is a specialist on hackberry, and we didn't have any hackberry. Well, we do now. I planted hackberry. Uh, it took three, four years for the butterflies to find our hackberry, but they finally did. And now we have a good population of, of both. I went out and looked at one of my hackberry branches just walking by this June. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So another big success. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, but along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod. Excuse me. Goldenrod is a top producer of, of caterpillars. 110 species eat it. Things like the uh, brown hooded owlet, the Arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct Sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is the goldenrod flower moth. I'm waiting for this one. It still has not made it to our, our property. That's what the caterpillars look like. I don't know why, but so this is this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the, the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and check my goldenrod, trying to find goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I will find it and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. You know, a lot of people don't like Virginia creeper. I don't know why, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful plant. It supports a whole bunch of sphinx moths. It's beautiful in the fall. It can climb the trees without pulling them down. Uh, but I planted it so that I could take pictures of all those sphinx moths, things like the Pandora sphinx, it's beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, uh, and many other caterpillars. I wanted the zebra swallowtail because it's, in my opinion, it's our prettiest swallowtail. But I was pushing it here because we're at the northern limit of both the zebra swallowtail and its host plant, pawpaw. We didn't have any pawpaw, so we planted pawpaw. The nearest population of zebra swallowtails that I know of is 26 miles south of us. So I really didn't know if this was gonna work. 
Uh, but it, it took a while. We had to wait nine years, but finally they found our pawpaws. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx and lots of pawpaws. I wanted the double tooth prominent because I think it's one of the coolest looking caterpillars. It's an elm specialist. So we planted American elm. So now we've got those species. Wanted evening primrose moth. It's one of the shinia moths, very beautiful. But we didn't have an evening primrose, now we do. And this is how the moth spends the day, hiding in the flowers of the evening primrose. Uh, we planted a lot of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the plants we put in our yard. But I wanna focus on oaks for a while because because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it is 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And uh, a lot of people think that you need, your, your oaks have to be huge before they can start contributing in meaningful ways to your property. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak. I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, unless you die before next year, you will live long enough to enjoy it. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns or as two foot bare root whips. And right away, they started to attract the, the insects that require oaks. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucalatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks we put on our property and they come right away. This is a pin oak that has just popped above the leaves here and here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that plant. You do not have to wait centuries before your oak starts to contribute. This is a picture of our house. Um, I'm, did I tell you I'm sitting in this window here? I'm still in that window right there. Uh, but this is what it looks like um, right about now. I took this picture a few years ago, but it hasn't changed much. Just to give you an idea, we do have lawn. We're very traditional, but we put plants back. Not all the plants. I'm still adding plants whenever I get the chance, but I noticed right away that a lot of life came to those plants. So about four years ago, I, I decided I would start to I would try to take pictures of every species of moth I could find on the property. I am now up to 1,027 species of moths. Now remember, we're on 10 acres in Pennsylvania. A Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we have 40% of all the moths that occur in Pennsylvania. And each one of those moth species is uh, a type of bird food. So because we have so much bird food, 59 species of birds have bred on our, our 10 acres. Putting the plants back works, it works. You know, I saw this, this headline, what, two weeks ago? The World Wildlife Fund says that two thirds of, of Earth's wildlife have, have vanished since 1970. And all I can say is not at our house. I would, I'm willing to wager that we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds since we, we have had the property. It's 20 years now, but um, they're still coming. So this is a very positive message. We can turn these, these terrible headlines on their heads. We can reverse it. All we have to do is put the plants back. But I know what you're thinking. That's 10 acres. You don't own 10 acres. You're in suburbia. Will it work in suburbia? Well, let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. I was uh, visiting them just before the virus broke out. Uh, they live in a typical suburban neighborhood. It's, they've got 0.6 acres, so a little bit more than half an acre, about 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They're surrounded by neighbors with big lawns, the typical suburban thing. The important invasive, invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. It's everywhere. So the first thing the Terpster did was get rid of their bush, bush honeysuckle, put in lots of species of native plants, uh, and they also put in what they call a bubbler, a little water feature for the birds. And they sat back and started to count the birds that use their, their property. And they are up to 149 bird species, 35 warbler species. That's, that's almost all the warblers in the, in the country. Just to put that in perspective, you know, we have 18 times more property than they do. We've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. Uh, so yes, it works on smaller properties. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in uh, Chicago. And I mean in Chicago. She lives right next to one of O'Hare Airport's runways, right next to Kennedy Expressway. She has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller 
than the, the average lot size in North America. So she did the same thing. She, she uh, pulled out her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and she started to count her birds. She's up to 116 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. Now she's, there is no connectivity between her yard and any other natural area. So she's a little island and still able to attract all this life. What about city centers though? 82% of us in the US now live in cities. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant. This is Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed, uh, which reminds me, we have, uh, we have a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and then wonder why people don't wanna plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed anymore. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. So I was staring at Monarch's Delight 2014. The first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bees. Megachylid bees. I know they're leafcutter bees because they collect their pollen on their tummy, not on their, their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements and if they don't meet those requirements, they can't live there. They need pollen, they need nectar, but they also need soft leaves and leaves of red buds are perfect because they can carve out the edge of those leaves very easily, roll them up and stuff them full of pollen and that's where they lay their eggs and that's how they reproduce. Then they take that whole package and put it in a crack or a crevice. There was a, a red bud plant right next to the, the Monarch's Delight. So the, the leaf cutter bees had everything they needed. Of course they're there. And because there was a red bud there, that means it bloomed early in the season providing a lot of forage for queen bumblebees. Queens are the only things that overwinter. They have no workers yet, so they need very efficient foraging in the early spring to get that colony going, otherwise it fails. There were bumblebees there. And then the big surprise of the day was I saw a monarch. I actually saw two monarchs on the monarch delight. Excuse me, right after dinner. This, remember this is 2014. 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point in the monarch population. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left in 2013. And this was June. Uh, so it's it's difficult for monarchs to get this far north uh, that and the east coast that, that early in the season. And here I was seeing two monarchs. I was very encouraged. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs to light. There was another milkweed there as well. So they had the, the nectar that they need, but they also had their host plant. This is where they're going to lay their eggs. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan, the middle of New York City. It's an elevated railroad that has been renovated. It's now a major tourist destination. Literally millions of people visit the High Line every year. Uh, it's 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of construction. I mean, there's not a whole lot of nature here, but it is enough to attract the monarchs. It's enough to attract 30 species of native bees. Somebody's doing a survey right now. There are birds there. There are lots of things uh, on the high line, even though there's not a whole lot to support them. This is Rick Dark. He, he uh, was after me to go to the high line for years. I'm not much of a city, city boy, so I, I dragged my feet. Um, you know, I knew I would see pretty plants, but I want to see the things that are on those plants. And I didn't think anything would be on those plants in the middle of Manhattan, but I was totally wrong. Uh, so it was a learning experience for me. And it convinced me that if thoughtful native plantings, and the, the High Line is not 100% native, but if, if some of the natives that are there can bring that much life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do it anywhere. Very encouraging. But there are four things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area that's in lawn. We have 40 million acres of lawn in the US, which is the size of New England, uh, which is now a deadscape. Um, you know, uh, lawn is a status symbol. It's certainly not an, an ecosystem. So what I'd like to do is, is shrink the lawn, is, is plant you know, productive plants in half the area that is now in lawn across the country. And if we did that, in half of the 40 million acres, that gives us 20 million acres to use for conservation. If we do it home, we can build a national park. We'll call it Homegrown National Park, and it will be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. There are real, there are measurable benefits to having nature where you live. One of them is you, you get to establish for the first time or re-establish a personal relationship with the natural world. And you can do it at your own pace, at your own time. 
you can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, you and millions of other people are there as well. So that's your biggest experience is with other people. No admission free or yeah, it's free. No admission fee because it's free. Um, no travel hassles. It's never closed no matter what pandemic comes comes down the, the road. But you get, get to experience the natural world alone. And that's the way you're going to create this this. Um, personal relationship. Why do you need a personal relationship? We are the stewards of the planet. If we don't understand what we're stewarding, we're going to be lousy stewards. And that's the state we're in right now. We're lousy stewards because most people don't have a clue what's out there or that they even need to take care of it, especially our kids. Our kids are, are suffering from what Richard Liu calls uh, nature deficit disorder. So what do we do? We, we, we get 30 kids and put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and get out at a natural place and walk around for another hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything and then they get back in the bus and, and go back home. And I'm sure that's better than nothing, but that's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. They need to discover things in nature all by themselves. No parental supervision, just let them go outside and do it. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii. Uh, and her patch of nature is not very big. It's about 10 feet by 10 feet of, of lawn and a hedge. But there are no lizards there. And this is how you do it. You get on the ground and you disguise yourself with sticks and leaves. And you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is, this is serious stuff. You can wear your best dress, though. Uh, then you catch the lizard and you put it in an aquarium and you've got that personal relationship. This is a game that she invented on her own. Uh, and I don't think she's going to be hunting lizards on the ground the rest of her life, but I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. If you want to do more than hunt lizards, get this book, uh, Nancy Strinitzi's Nature Play at Home. Um, dozens and dozens of, of ideas of how you can expose kids to the natural world. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What are we going to put in the in the part of the lawn that we take out? Uh, we're going to put the the most productive plants that we know, and I, I'm calling them keystone plants. One of the most important things that we have learned in our lab recently is that uh, most there's really just a few native plants that are doing most of the work. About five percent of our native plants are making about seventy five percent of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food, which means 85% of our native plants aren't doing all that much, at least in terms of food web. So the question is no longer simply are natives better than non-natives. Uh, on average, they certainly are, but I can create an all native landscape that supports almost nothing because there are a lot of, lot of really well protected native plants out there. So the question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our human dominated landscapes or ecologically destructive plants. So things like those, like burning bush and barberry and, and uh, buckthorn and all the, you know, the, the ornamentals we brought in and are now serious invasive species biologically polluting the land around us. I get an email once or twice a year from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native and that means we can plant them and everything will be great. Uh, yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native now, um, but that this is not our metric anymore. I don't care if they're native or not. I don't care if they grew on the moon 7 million years ago. The metric is what are they supporting? And the answer is zero, zero species of caterpillars on ginkgo. That's what they look like. If you ever find a caterpillar eating ginkgo, take a picture of it, please, and send it to me and you will be the first. So you can plant ginkgo, but it's a decoration. It's not contributing uh, meaningfully to the, the food web on your, your property. What is? Uh, well, oaks are the number one, um, the number one keystone plant in 84% of the counties of North America, certainly number one up in, in Cape Cod. They're supporting 557 species of caterpillars just in the mid-Atlantic states, over 900 species nationwide, and each one of those is, is a species of bird food. There is no other plant genus that comes close to that level of productivity. Let's look at the power of keystone oaks uh, in, in our yard here in Pennsylvania. Now remember, I've taken pictures of 1,027 moth species. Just moths, haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. Out of that 1,027 moth species, 
902 have known host plants. So there's, there's what, 125? I still don't know what they, what they eat. Of the 902 species that we do know what they eat, 265 species use oaks. We have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property, and only one of them is, is the genus Quercus, the oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting almost 30% of our moss species diversity. And a whole lot, uh, you know, huge contributions to all of those birds that, that breed here. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of, of my landscape. That's the power of a keystone plant. How do you find out what the keystone plants are for where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website and you put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, both woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. Um, so, so your list is going to look something like this. Um, oaks are typically at the top followed by uh, native native uh, cherries. Um, so on, on, on Cape Guide you've got a lot of uh, um, what's it called? Beach plum. Beach, beach plum. Is that right? I think that's right. Um, a lot of willows. Those are all very high. Uh, blueberries, very high. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native maples. If you go to the to the nursery and you say I want to buy a cherry, they're probably going to sell you an Asian cherry. They're probably if you say I want a willow, they sell you a weeping willow from from uh, the Middle East. Um, if you ask for an oak, you very well might end up with a, a, a Chinese oak or an English oak. We've got 90 species of oaks in this country. Why would we want to plant a, a Chinese oak? I can't, can't imagine. So specify uh, the, 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 um, that you want at least a native oak and you might know exactly which species you, you want. Because if you don't, if you get a non-native member of these native genera, it's going to reduce caterpillar production by 68%. We have measured that. Here are the top uh, ranked um, herbaceous plants. Goldenrod's always way up there. Native asters uh, are, are um, unadulterated sunflowers, things like perennial sunflowers. And these are also the top three genera in terms of, of supporting specialist bees. These three genera alone support over 40 species of, of bees that can't reproduce on any other types of pollen. So if you don't have these plants in your yard, you've lost the opportunity of supporting 40 species of native bees. That's the power of, of keystone plants. So we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in the plants that attract a whole lot of life to our yard. And then at night, we will kill them with our, our security light. And that of course is not the goal. But there's a lot of research, a growing body of research, particularly from Europe, demonstrating that light pollution at, at night is a major cause of insect declines. You know, after 100 years of wondering why moths fly around lights, round, 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 we still don't know. But we do know that they die from exhaustion. They die from colliding with the light by getting incinerated by uh, just dehydration. Um, it increases predation. The bat comes and picks them off. Uh, there are a lot of nocturnal insects that are blinded by bright lights and it messes up what they're all about. They're supposed to be mating and, and uh, laying eggs, but instead they're sitting at a light. So uh, to me, this is actually good news because if we have identified a major cause of insect decline, it's one of the easiest things to fix. All we have to do is turn our lights out. I know what you're saying. I can't turn my light out because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your security light and it will only turn on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're gonna notice is how often the bad man does not come. If you don't wanna do that, take the white light app, particularly mercury vapor bulbs and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to insects than our white wavelengths. And yellow LED lights are the least attractive. If we were to replace our night lights with yellow LED lights, Overnight, we would save billions of insects uh, and uh, we'd save a ton of energy too. It, it seems like a real no brainer. The fourth thing we need to do is we need to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania and in Chester County, Pennsylvania, oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them like the polyphemus moth can complete their development on the tree itself. The, the caterpillar eats the leaves and it spins a cocoon and hangs from the branch. Then it emerges as an adult and then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. 
But most of them don't do that. 94%, 480 species drop from the tree and many of them wiggle below the ground and, and uh, pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter uh, and then spend the winter in, in that leaf litter. But of course, that's the problem. We don't have any leaf litter under our trees and we, we mow the area and compact it to the point where the ground is so hard the caterpillars can't get, get underground. So this becomes a, an ecological trap we, we call in the moths with uh, appropriate plants. They lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, they drop down and then they die. And the next generation is smaller and the next generation after that is probably gone entirely. I am convinced that the way we, we do not allow caterpillars to complete their development is one of the major causes of, of insect decline, uh, at least in North America. And of course the, the cement landscape is even less of a, of a viable option for, for moths and butterflies. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of, of cement as a default landscape. I mean, this is just laziness and it destroys our watersheds. We know better. This is what most people do. You put a tree in the middle of a lawn and nobody has measured how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they do better in a situation like this where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape. You could have a dogwood here, you could have uh, your native azalea and your ferns and your ground covers. The caterpillar drops down, it can easily find leaves to spin its cocoon in or wiggle below the ground because it's not compacted. Nobody's gonna mow it, nobody's gonna step on it. It's a safe site. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. And by the way, this is how you shrink the lawn. Put big beds around your, your trees. Uh, and you've all that area is now out of, of uh, grass. And again, it becomes a safe site for those caterpillars. You can use your, your ground covers, your wild ginger, your, your native pachysandra, your may apples, your foam flower, many options there. And all of those are safe sites. Uh, another graduate student, Desiree Narango, uh, worked with chickadees in the suburbs of, of Washington, DC. And she studied population dynamics of chickadees in different types of landscapes, right? In suburban, our suburban yards. And she discovered that there actually is room for compromise in our plant choice. And that's, that's very important. What she did, one of the things she did was to, to compare how chickadee populations can be sustained in landscapes that uh, have a lot of natives in them. None of them are 100% native, native uh, versus landscapes that had a lot of introduced plants, the typical Asian ornamentals that we, we use uh, a lot of. And the first thing she found is when they're loaded with Asian ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you, you reduce the amount of uh, food for the birds by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Uh, so even though there's a nest box up in each one of these landscapes, the birds came, looked around and said, there's not enough food here. Uh, we're not even gonna try to, to breed. If they did try to breed, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive, the clutches were. Uh, if they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do it. So you might say, well, those aren't huge differences. But if you put them all together in a population growth model as a function of the percentage of, of woody plant biomass in your yard from no or woody plant non-native biomass from no non-native plants to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. If you reproduce at this rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population, but if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap, uh, which suggests that when you exceed 30% woody non-native plant biomass in your, in your yard, so you're back out here, uh, you're not gonna be able to sustain bird reproduction. And we've measured, uh, like uh, where I live, the Northeast Maryland, Southeast Pennsylvania and Delaware, 82% of the landscape in our, our suburban developments are non-native plants. So we're way, way down here in the, the highly unsustainable part of the curve. But this is the part that I'm excited about where they overlap because this area here represents that area of compromise. You can have up to 30%. So you can have your, your, your crepe myrtle or your, or your boxwood or your, uh, you know, whatever favorite ornamental that, that you love, as long as it's not an invasive species. We're not gonna allow that because they don't stay in your yard. They become biological pollution. Uh, 
Uh, but you can have all those things without destroying bird reproduction. And that's good news to me because if I said you can't have any, any non-native plants at all, very few people would be listening. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. This is a, a formal garden in, um, down in North Carolina. I gotta track down who sent this to me, but they're working. What they're doing is, is taking out the plants uh, that are there now and putting in all native plants. This is Joe Pye. Notice I didn't say Joe Pye weed. It's not a weed. Uh, and when they finish, they will send me another, another picture. Uh, just to prove that that uh, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. So, so that works. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban lot like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. It's beautiful. It's functional. It supports lots of bees. Let's, let's review why we need bees. You know, if I, if I were to ask you, you'd probably say, well, because they pollinate 30% of our, our agriculture. It's actually much less than that, but, but let's leave that. A lot of people think that when we talk that way, that if they don't live next to an ag field, they don't need any bees. But the real reason we need pollinators is because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, not an option. It is simply not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Every place we want plants, which is every place, including our yards. So this is one way to do it. This is another way. This is a Drew Latham design. You know, it's formalized by some edging here. It's very attractive. Imagine the amount of, the, the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. That's pretty, but it's dead. A lot of life here. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And there are more and more programs where this is happening. Minnesota has a cost sharing program. It's actually paying homeowners to replace some or, or all of their lawn with appropriate uh, Minnesota uh, prairie plants. Very productive program. Florida, there's an island in Florida that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species to burrow in their front yards. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. You reward people for being good stewards of endangered species and everybody would want one, believe me. Missouri had a, a, a bounty on cattle repair, one of our most invasive orna ornamentals and, and Fayetteville has a, a bounty right now too. So somehow you document that you've taken down a cattle repair and they give you a free tree replacement. Uh, even, even public utilities, the San Antonio water systems giving people hundred dollar coupons to plant uh, water efficient native plants near San Antonio. And there's all those, those lawn removal programs in the far west, particularly California. $2 per square foot rebate if you replace your thirsty lawn with appropriate xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in our early years of conservation. The first one is, is that we've assumed that nature's important. We like it, but it's not essential. That's the misstep, assuming it's not essential, which means when resources are tight, which is always, nature always loses. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo just before the virus broke out. Uh, and they had this wall size poster there, saving wildlife for future generations. And this is, I hear this, you can read about any of the conservation uh, um, journals or, or top conservation biologists in the country talk this way. We need to save it for future generations. But to me, that suggests that nature's there just for entertainment. We do want our kids to know what the natural world was like, but we really need to save it so that we have another generation. I mean, that's, it's much more serious, much more urgent than just, just entertainment. Second misstep is that we've assumed humans and nature cannot coexist. But by doing that, we're restricting conservation efforts to just small little areas on the planet where there aren't many humans. And that means we're gonna fail because those areas aren't large enough and not connected enough to sustain the life we need them to sustain. David Quammen has a, a really neat uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And that is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN has uh, designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the earth has ecological significance, including your yard. 
So what we need to do is glue our rug back together again. We've got to fill in these, all those white areas, no man's land. That's where our cities and suburbs, that's where we live. That's where we, we landscape just for aesthetics, but not for function. We got to put those keystone plants back and then diversify. We're not just building biological carters so that plants and animals can move back and forth between real habitat. We're going to create real habitat in all these white spaces. In other words, we're going to start to share our spaces with, with nature. It's funny how we call them our spaces. You know, we took them from nature. We got to we got to give them back now. The third misstep was to, to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. And I have no idea why, because every person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. And we're real good at teaching this one. We're terrible about teaching, teaching um, not just our young folks, but our old folks too, that we all have obligations in earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. This approach empowers each one of us. Right now, you know, there's a lot of depression running around. We look at the huge problems that the earth has and it's easy to feel powerless. Like there's nothing one person can do, but this is, this is something one person can do. Go out and plant that oak tree. Reduce the size of your lawn, put in your pollinator garden, get rid of your invasive species. You as one person have now created a biological sanctuary. You're an important cog in the wheel of conservation now. And it, it was you. You get to see the results. It happens right away. It also shrinks the, the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. They're too big. You really will get depressed uh, if you do that. Just worry about your piece of the earth that you can, you can influence. If you own land, that's obvious. That's where you're going to focus. And if everybody who owned land fixed it up, we'd be 85% done. If you don't own land, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a, a, your, the nearest park or preserve. Land managers are, are short, uh, they're underfunded and, and understaffed everywhere. So they would love your, your volunteer actions. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and ultimately our, our own. Now I've convinced my, my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. That was absolutely fantastic. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's really impactful of information. So um, we're now going to open the question and answer session. There's already a couple questions in the chat. You should all feel free to put more questions in there. Maybe I'll start it off with, with a question. Uh, one thing I thought that was fascinating about your book and your talk is the idea that um, native plants, ecologically productive plants are helpful to the native caterpillars because they've co-adapted. The caterpillars can detoxify these particular plants. What does that tell us then if you go to the garden center and you try to get a native plant, a lot of times they'll have uh, cultivars related to the native plants, but not exactly. What do you say about those? Well, it's a good question. It's actually the most common question I get because it's true. If you go to buy a native plant, it's going to be a cultivar. A cultivar is a genetic variant of the straight species. Um, so, so a lot of those cultivars are actually found in nature. And somebody, somebody then brings them in and puts a name on them and clones them so that the trait isn't lost. Uh, but it was, it was a genetic variant created in the natural world. So you would expect them to be uh, pretty good. But we actually did an experiment looking at, at uh, six different common cultivar traits. None of them had anything to do with flowers. It was growth habits. So what happens when you take a tall plant, and make it short? What happens when you introduce disease resistance? When you enhance berry size? When you have uh, when you take a green leaf and make it red or purple, or have leaf variegation? Those types of, of traits. And we had a big common garden experiment and grew the straight species and the the cultivars right next to each other for three years. And the only trait that consistently changed or, 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 or negatively impacted insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. 
because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are, they're unpalatable to insects. But the other traits, believe it or not, didn't influence insect use at all. So for all those cultivars that are out there, that's, that's good news. Um, there is one thing about cultivars that, that is a problem, I think, and that is that most of them are propagated clonally, which means there's zero genetic variability. And you know the big feature of climate change that is clobbering everything is not the slow warming, but the the extreme, you know, erratic behavior of our weather. The extreme variability: drought one day, 15 inches of rain the next day, 30 degrees, then 80 degrees. These wild swings um, are what's stressing our plants, and it's genetic variability in our plant populations that are going to be able to, to handle that. So if we load our, our landscapes with plants with zero genetic variability, that's, you know, we know that's not a good idea. Annie White at the University of uh, Vermont has been looking at what happens when you change flower traits. And that's our most common type of, of cultivar. You know, we make uh, echinacea look like, like zinnias. Um, the, excuse me. Uh, mm. The nursery trade is convinced that you're still going to buy plants simply because of what they look like. And it's, it's, um, it's like the fashion trade. You've got to have a new cultivar each year so that you buy new plants because they look different. Uh, well, when you alter flower traits, um, the chances of messing up a specialized relationship between specialized bees and that flower are very high. Uh, so the anyway, it's news is not, not as good as our news that, that um, many of the flower traits uh, decrease the, the um, usefulness of those plants to pollinators. Not all of them. So the answer is always, it depends on which one you're talking about. But um, I'd like to see the straight species offered for sale. Uh, along with those cultivars and let the marketplace work it out. You know, the, the, the nursery industry just wants to sell plants. They're not married to cultivars or to Chinese plants. If you're going to buy the native plants, they'll sell them. But you have, the market's got to be there. Great. Thank you. There's a bunch of questions coming into the chat. Um, maybe one here, a, a very practical question. How many leaves should we leave in the fall on the lawn, <laughs> in the driveway, in the beds? What do you recommend there? Twelve. Leave 12 leaves. Well, yeah. <laughs> as many as your, your neighbors will tolerate. How's that? Yeah. You know, leaves are the perfect mulch. If you find yourself going out and buying bark mulch or anything, you know, that is a big mistake. Use your leaves. We should think about our leaves the way we think about water now. Now the, you know, the best practice is to make sure every drop of rain that falls on your property stays on your property and infiltrates. And you're supposed to landscape in ways that make that happen. Same thing with leaves. Every leaf that falls in your property should stay there because it's loaded with nutrients that were taken up from your soil and it needs to recycle. It's the perfect addition to your soil to get the organic matter hard, high. The, the number of species that live in our soil far exceeds the number of species that live above it. So the soil ecosystem is really important and, and it all starts with good leaf litter. My son uh, bought a house uh, about two years ago, and he called me up in the first fall, and he said, uh, he said, Dad, I've got too many leaves. What should I do with my leaves? I said, put them in your flower beds. He said, I don't have enough flower beds. I said, exactly. That's where you put your leaves, and that's how you shrink your lawn. Create, that's how you can control the grass around your, your, uh, in your new beds. Just load them with leaves until the grass is suppressed. Then you can plant right through it. That's a wonderful answer. I love it. There's several questions here asking about non-native moths and caterpillars. So we have a winter moth situation around here. People might also have insects that are doing so much chewing on your trees that they might be killing the trees. So how, what do you do about how to balance, well, first of all, what you do about the non-natives and then also what if you think all these caterpillars are going to kill your plants? What do you do? You know, typically the caterpillars that are going to kill your plants are the non-natives. They're very few uh, even the outbreak species of native insects rarely kill our plants. We think if there's any bite out of a leaf, it's going to kill the plant. Our plants are much more resilient than we give them credit for. But the gypsy moth, the winter moth, the, the brown tail moth, um, all of these, any, the emerald ash borer, the hemlock woolly adelgid, any introduced insect is a serious problem because they're here without their natural enemies. So they are not controlled. Out of all of the introduced caterpillars that we have, 
winter moth actually does offer something to the birds. It's a, it's a geometrid, it's an inchworm that is not well defended. It doesn't have hairs or stingers or anything else. And the migrating birds love them. Uh, the trouble is we don't have enough migrating birds anymore. You know, our birds are down a, a third of their population. So you put that together with where the winter moth outbreaks, which is typically in cities where we spray and kill all the parasitoids and everything else. Then they get out of whack pretty pretty quickly. Although there is some good news there. I talked to uh, the guy at University of Massachusetts who's been working on winter moth biocontrol. Uh, and it's working. It's working so well that he can't find good populations anymore to, to study. So um, so that one should should be in good shape. But you know, I, I yes, we need insects, but we do not need any non-native insects. What should you do with them? You know what to do with them. It creatively. Kill them. I mean, you got <laughs> But you want to kill them in a way it doesn't kill the other end. So broad scale spraying is not the answer because then you're killing everything, including their natural enemies. The problem is bringing them in. Getting rid of them is much, much harder. Yeah. Great. Let's see a couple questions about planting trees or other plants. So one question is, uh, if you want to plant oaks, what size plant do you recommend or not recommend? Are there ways to make them more successful? Uh, is it risky to plant elms because of Dutch elm disease? And aside from oaks and elms, are there any plants particularly beneficial in the Cape Cod ecosystem? That's a specialized question. Yeah, those native, native uh, uh, cherries are real beneficial in the Cape Cod system. Um, so add, add them to the oaks. And you've got native willows too that are, that's the cherries and willows are tied for number two on that ranked list there. Um, do you want to plant your trees as small as possible? which is exactly the opposite of what we typically do. Everybody wants instant gratification. So they buy the biggest oak tree they can for thousands of dollars and then it's transplanted. But in order to transplant it, you've got to root prune it. Uh, and when you root prune it, it takes years, decades to rebuild that root system. And it's never as good as it was before you root pruned it. Uh, the tree has a 50% chance of dying uh, because of the shock to its system. When you plant an acorn or a tiny tree, it can develop its roots uh, from scratch and they grow much faster. I have an interesting little experiment. Actually, it's over at this point in, in my yard where uh, my brother-in-law actually has a native plant nursery. And years ago, shortly after we moved in, he dug a, it was about a 12 foot red oak. And uh, he dug it for somebody to to buy and the guy never came and picked it up so he was stuck with it and it was out of the ground he said do you want it and we said sure yeah so he dug this massive hole you know great big root ball and the big truck you know, and what a what a hassle getting it in the ground we got it in the ground never looked very good but same day i planted an acorn from a willow oak that i got from my mother-in-law's property and he said what are you doing that for i said well you know here it is i'm planting it <laughs> and it's it's about 30 feet from the, the red oak. Well, now the, the willow oak is bigger than the red oak. The circumference of the willow oaks are like this. Now they do grow quickly, but so do red oaks. So that's, that's not the thing. And the red oak actually, it's gonna die. It, it never, never has taken off. The roots never were able to rebuild very fast. The point is that, that you will, your, your tiny tree will grow faster in the end and be much healthier the smaller you, you plant. There is an issue though. And that is when they're small, you have to protect them from deer because the deer love those baby oaks. So that's where some kind of caging is appropriate. Okay. And one more question about trees. Oh, a question the, about the, the elms. Trees. Yes, oh, about oh, yeah. the elms. Yeah. Um, I have, I'll, I'll just tell you, we do have Dutch elm disease, but um, uh, there's far less of it now because we, we, you know, we wiped out all the elms. We don't have monocultures of elms anymore. Uh, there were a few elms at the University of Delaware that survived. Uh, and, and when we moved in, I got some seeds from the curb, the, you know, just the windrow of seeds from these elms. Uh, and I planted, I put them in a little flat, they germinated in six days, and then I planted them. And within, within nine years, they're about 30 feet tall. And now 20 years, they're like 80 feet tall. I mean, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with these trees. Uh, so they're no special cultivar for resistance. Um, I do think that if we, uh, you know, if we planted the number of elms that we used to have, the, the disease would really go crazy again. But um, these are good trees and, and, you know, they grow so fast, they support so many insects. If they were to die now, I've had 20 great years for them and I'd start all over again. It's okay. 
Uh, but yeah. to say, well, I'm never going to plant an elm because they might die. Eh, you know, go for that resistance. You might find it. Yeah. So there's a question about would you, would you use insecticides to protect your elms or your oaks? As you already said not a broad spectrum one for sure. Yeah. I don't have to use. I've never used a touch of insecticide on my, my elms. There, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. Um, if you have the oaks are, are a trickier problem because when if you get gypsy moth coming through and if it gypsy moth explodes when you have a couple dry years in a row. When you have wet years, there's a, a fungus now that keeps it well, well under under wraps. But um, and that's exactly what's happened in Cape Guide. You had a couple dry years in a road, and you know after after many years, it, it exploded again. And uh, combined with the drought and sandy soils, uh, it can be real hard on the oaks. You know that is they killed a lot of the oaks. So do we want to kill the oaks? Absolutely not. So so you've got this choice: should I spray my oak and control the gypsy moths? until they they go away or do i lose my oak i probably would spray it too because because the oak you know you want a couple hundred years out of your oak you don't you don't want to lose that but when keep in mind when you spray your oak you're killing everything on it so that that year it's very hard on the breeding birds and everything else you know the real the the real um the real problem starts when we bring these things in, but uh, it's a judgment call about whether or not you're going to treat the these these pests. Yeah, great. Let's see. There's a question. How do I how do I dispose of invasives that we take from our yard? Barberry, Japanese knotweed. What do you do with them? Yeah, uh, Japanese knotweed's a tough one. A a piece of the root the size of my pinky nail will start a new plant. So if you just start throwing it out in a compost pile or something, that's not going to work. Most of the other things, though, it, it just kills them. There's nothing special. Um, out of all the invasives, our property was just loaded with everything. Uh, they actually break down really quickly. I have to be a little careful with autumn olive. I, pull, I, I uh, you know, actually had a tractor and, and pulled a lot of the big ones out with a chain and then chopped them up for steaks when I was putting cages around my, my young oaks. I left them lying in the field all summer long, exposed. Then in the fall, I pounded in the stakes, and they all they all took root. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is tough to kill an, an autumn olive. But the other things, uh, multiflora rosa, that breaks down real real fast. Japanese knotweed is is a problem. I, I don't know, burn it, do something with it. But um, just throwing it out in the woods is only going to make more Japanese knotweeds. out for a second. I think I'm back. Yep, we hear you. I, uh, yeah. The question, the question, I've, uh, someone's been focusing on gardening for bees. What do you say about gardening for bees? Do you mean honeybees or native bees? Hmm. We'll call it native bees. <laughs> um, now I got a whole talk on that. <laughs> uh, you know, usually people are talking about honeybees and, and that's fine, but um, there is an issue with uh, bringing in a hive with thousands of, of native of honeybees in terms of competing with for forage with those those honey those native bees. So if you move and a lot of say people have a field and say, can I put my hives in your field? And a lot of people say yes. Um, you really are creating a competitive situation for all the native bees that need the stuff in that field. If we had the amount of forage for bees that we used to have, um, then it, it wouldn't be an issue. There's enough for both the native and the honeybees, but typically we've gotten rid of so many of the flowers that uh, there, there is an issue. So the, the biggest things in terms of keeping all the bees happy, both the native and the honeybee, is having continuous bloom from uh, April all the way through the end of October uh, because they can't go a month without blooming things in, in the middle. Um, so that's the, the hardest hardest thing to accomplish, and it takes a variety of different blooming plants. You have to really think about it. And now it looks like we definitely did lose Jessica. No, I, I, I'm here. I just turned off my video to try to preserve my uh, oh, ability to talk okay. to you. There you are again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Yeah. So a couple other other questions. Somebody says, I, "I'm afraid you're preaching to the choir. How do we get the public to hear you? How do we influence the nurseries to sell the kind of plants we want?" Actually, I might add to that. You know, uh, how about the the people who are maintaining the rights of way under the power lines? Could they perhaps? You know, do something yeah, you know all of that is starting to happen the, the power line companies are, are figuring out they can actually save money with proper management uh, and they get a lot of, of uh, popular press by by green management of their power lines uh, so I actually talked at a conference of, of power line companies it was 
what was before the virus last year ago or something. And uh, people from all over the country, they're learning how to do this. So there's a lot of, lot of positive movement there. Uh, but it's true. I talk to the choir. Um, I, it's, it's hard to, you know, I always want to have a, a bring your neighbor night where you use all your social capital and say, you have to come hear this talk because otherwise you never will, you know, you can give them my book, but they won't read it, you know, so, so that's never happened. But I always thought about that. But actually, I gave a talk um, more than a year ago, and there was a woman in the audience Michelle Alfunderi, who is a, she's a marketer. She's actually retired, but she said, I'm going to help you market this to the non-choir. I said, okay, I don't have time for any of this, you know, but she said, you need a website, you need a, and so she's created this, this, um, our new website is called homegrownnationalpark.com. Uh, and the idea is that it's, it's going to create a social buzz. Everybody's going to want to get on the park, on the, on the map. Um, and it's only been up for well, about two weeks now, but it really does seem to be working. People love this, this social media stuff. And um, the object is to, to uh, put in your data, uh, what part of your yard are you trying to restore? How much of it is it gonna be? And you get to be a dot on the map and then we get to see the map filled in. And so maybe this will work in, in terms of, of getting people that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be interested. I don't know, uh, I hope so. Yeah. Another question while we're talking about sort of social media, are there any websites you can recommend that show example native landscape designs, the sorts of plans people might use for their yard? Well, you know, there is no native plan. Um, okay. The plants you use, landscape design, there's for any one landscape, there can be a thousand different designs depending on what the homeowner wants and what the goal is. The plant choice you use is what, what makes the difference, whether it's native or not. But um, I can take any design and make either all native or all non-native or some some mix. So no, there's no there's no website saying here's a native design. But there, um, that website, the homegrownnationalpark.com, does have a lot of uh, examples. Uh, the the Rick Dark's book, The Living Landscape. I wrote three chapters in that as well. Is you know it's an entire picture book of landscapes that are not 100%, although many of them are native, but largely native and gives you lots of ideas of how this, this can be used. So, so in terms of ideas of, of how to go about do this, I, I would recommend the living landscape. Um, so there. Yeah, great. <laughs> and let's see, a couple more questions here about just how we manage our own yard. So wood chips, good or bad? Is it okay to chop up your leaves with a lawnmower? And then another interesting question, you mentioned water features for birds, but is that just sort of decorative ornamental or is that actually something that the birds want and will come to? Mm -hmm. Okay, wood chips, no, no, not necessary. Use those leaves, remember. There's no reason to go out and to rake up your leaves, put them out in your curb and then go buy wood chips. Wood chips are not nearly as good as the leaves that you just threw, threw out. Should you chop up those leaves? No. The Luna moth that that uh, you know dropped down and spun a cocoon, actually spins a cocoon in the in the leaves, and then they drop off the tree. They're in there. You just chopped up your Luna moth. You chopped up uh, all the moths that are trying to overwinter in in your leaves. And why did you do that? Just so that it's smaller. That means they also break down faster. You never want your your leaf litter to disappear during the summer. If it's gone by by the end of July, you don't have enough. And um, oak leaves last a long time if they're not chopped up. But things like maples and birches and stuff, they, they break down really quickly. So uh, chopping them, putting them through the mower is going to shorten their life even, even more. So you don't want to do that. And I forget what the other question was. Uh, the water features. Oh, the water features. Yes. Um, no, the birds actually, uh, birds have to drink like anything else. So water features are much more effective when you're not living right next to a stream or a river and because then they don't need it. But so any kind of a dry area, they're really effective. And the reason that bubbling water is effective is the birds want clean water. They don't want stagnant pools. So when they hear it, it dripping or bubbling, that's the cue that it's clean. Uh, so they, they use it to drink and bathe. It's that simple. Great. Yeah, uh, let's see. I, actually, maybe I should just mention that someone from State Senator Moran's office was here and thought this was a fantastic, inspiring presentation. So we're, we yeah. are spreading the word. This is great. <laughs> uh, and I'm just scanning for any further questions that I missed. Yeah, is it okay to, is it okay to rake? Does that, does that destroy the moths and the... 
Um, you know, do it as gently as you can, but uh, for the, the part of the lawn you're going to keep, you do want to keep that well manicured. That's the cue for care that shows you are that good citizen, your, your high status. That's what lawn's all about. So we're not going to fight that. You're just going to have less lawn. And you do have to rake the leaves off that lawn because, you know, leaves laying on the lawn is a good way to kill it. Um, you know, be as gentle as you can. <laughs> that's all I can say. But, you know, gathering with the lawnmower is, uh, that's, that's not gentle. Yeah. Okay. A couple other questions. Uh, what about pine needles? And I have leaves with falls. What should I do? I don't know what pine that needles means. are leaves for conifers. Um, so, uh, you know, you don't, you don't really rake them, but let them, let them lay where they fall. That's the, the leaf litter that conifers want. Um, and, uh, you know, typical conifers throw so much shade, there's not a lot growing through that anyway, but uh, very good mulch. And what was the second part? Leaves with falls. What do you do with the leaf with the fall? I'm not sure what that means, but. You mean leaves in the fall? No, with falls. I don't know. Yeah. If that means some disease, I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah. is that a idea? I don't know what a yeah. leaf with a fall is. Oh, leaves with gall. Gall. Galls. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, galls are a feature of oaks. Oaks support uh, uh, thousands of species of galls, actually. And uh, there are a few, two or three, that are introduced. And they're the ones that might cause problems. But most galls are normal. Just ignore them. They're a feature of, of oaks. It's it's one of, it's part of the fauna that, that uh, is part of them. And oaks that are planted in unstressed areas usually can deal pretty well with the introduced uh, galls as well. Great. But you're never getting, you know, trying to throw out. First of all, the introduced galls are, are always on stems. They're not on leaves. So any, any leaf with a gall is probably a good one. All right, great. And then I'm just going to relay all the enthusiasm and thanks from the from the chat and from the Q&A. Everyone just thought this was a fantastic talk. I absolutely agree. And I'm going to hand it back to Reverend Natalie to say just a few closing words. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Great. Thank you. I want to echo Jessica's thanks. Dr. Ptolemy is great, really great talk and so grateful to have you with us. Uh, I am putting a link in the chat right now that should go to everybody. Um, that link has some next steps for people who want to stay involved in this kind of conversation. The 300 committee is actually doing a book group right now of Dr. Chalamet's book, Nature's Best Hope, and they are meeting on November 16th. There's an email there for more information. And St. Barnabas is focusing this, focusing this year on what we call creation care, environmental justice. And we have opportunities in December that look at the intersectionality between racism and environmental justice. And then in January, uh, we're running a series called Pacamama, Awakening the Dreamer. And we'd be happy to have you join us for any of those. And my contact information is on there and also links to sign up. And um, as a way of closing, I wanted to read a poem by someone named uh, Wendell Berry, who's an environmental, yes, uh, head nodding happening, a uh, poet, spirit of sort, lover of the lover of creation. And before I read that poem as a closing for us, I just invite everyone to put into the chat uh, so we can watch the thanks come in. Um, just expressions of gratitude or how you're feeling after the conversation today. So we'll take a moment of silence and please fill the chat with your gratitude and with your, uh, yeah, with your sentiments as we leave. Well, 
It seems that you have given us all a lot of hope, which we all need right now in this time. So thank you for that. You are welcome. This is called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the last sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world, of the wild things, and I am free. And with that, we will say good night. Thank you everyone for joining us. Good night.